My name is Nicola Balvin. I am part of the research team that had worked on the state of the world's children, which is the topic that we are focusing on this evening. And I will be moderating tonight's event. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Neil Graboy, Dean of the Milano School of International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy, to open the event with his welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you pronounced my name wonderfully. <laughs> it, it, it has about seven. Oh, you were ah, you were practicing. Uh, but thank you very much for for that introduction, and uh, I'm delighted to welcome all of you here. Uh, this is uh, the new school, as you know, a very special place. Uh, we were talking a little bit about our commitments to social justice, making a difference in society, and I think uh, our conference. Uh, this evening is uh, consonant with that set of goals and that set of commitments. Uh, in this, uh, this particular occasion, uh, we, we welcome and the UNICEF and Equity for Children and their presentation on 2012 State of the World of Children, the flagship publication of UNICEF. Uh, we have many distinguished guests uh, with us today, and I would like to thank uh, Khaled Mansour, and his UNICEF team, and I wish to recognize Michael Cohen, uh, my colleague, who is the director of the Graduate Program in International Affairs at the New School. I would like to thank UNICEF, our co-hosts for today. Uh, the New School and UNICEF have, in fact, a long association through Equity for Children. Together, we've organized the International Conference covering a wide range of topics in the field of child poverty and rights, from adolescent girls to education and cash transfers. Urban areas offer great potential to improve, or not, unfortunately, the lives of children. Having grown up in New York City in a tough neighborhood in Brooklyn, I needed some UNICEF help, but it wasn't there 100 years ago. Uh, however, poverty and inequity are a painful reality all over the urbanized world, representing a challenge for development and for human rights. This is one of the key issues on which the Milano International Affairs Program concentrates its teaching and research efforts. Today's program represents the best of what the Milano School has to offer, a world-class gathering of scholars, students, and practitioners discussing and debating today's most pressing global issues. Equity for Children began in 2006 as one faculty member's compelling idea. Today, the program operates on two continents, serving as a hub and resource for our students and all those committed to securing children's rights around the world. I'm proud to say that Professor Alberto Nuchin and his ideas continue to advance the program he founded. And now, I will turn the floor over so Nicola Balvin from UNICEF. Thank you very much and welcome. And now introducing the event on behalf of UNICEF, please welcome Khaled Mansour, Director of the Division of Communication at UNICEF headquarters in New York. Thank you, Nicola. And uh, thank you, Dean Graboy, for your kind welcome. We had a short discussion before we started about the history of this place. And I think the Milan School is the perfect host for this event. Because of its history of encouraging creative thinking in the service of progressive social and economic change and social justice. It's encouraging to think that we can draw on that history when we speak today and when we listen to the distinguished panel of speakers. There is also the work that you refer to, the work of the Equity for Children Initiative, and the collective expertise of our diverse panelists and audience. I would like to thank everyone in the audience here today. We have a wonderful uh, turnout for your interest and for joining us this evening. This gathering is like the State of the World Children Report itself. It is the result of a collaboration among many people, and I would like to recognize some of them. In particular, I would like to thank Professors Cohen 
and Minuhin, thank you. And also Mina Keys and Yang Gun Kem, Bet Hell and their colleagues at the new school. Two of our researchers on the report are actually sitting on the table. I would also like to recognize them. Uh, Nicola Balvin, who is introducing it, and Solipa. But in the audience, we have the third researcher who did work on the report, Miidan Mekonin. And of course, we have our editor of the report sitting in the first row here, Abid Aslam. UNICEF values such collaborations because it provides an opportunity to engage with an audience that has the influence to improve the lives of the children. We are here to discuss the topic of the 2012 edition of UNICEF flagship publication, The State of the World of Children, which focuses on children in urban areas. Over half of the world's seven billion people now live in urban areas. More than one billion children live in cities and towns, and we have one of them with us here tonight, which is a pleasure to have. Many of them enjoy the advantages of urban life, including access to education, medicine, uh, medical facilities, recreational services. However, hundreds of millions of children live in informal settlements and slums under some of the most challenging conditions on earth. They endure hunger, they endure ill health, and the denial of such crucial services as education, clean water, and sanitation. This should inspire shame and action on the part of the political, commercial, and cultural elites who live in the very same cities. And yet, for all their deprivations, the residents of low-income neighborhoods, informal settlements, and slums contribute to the very economies and societies that marginalize them. These families provide the relatively expensive, inexpensive labor that powers so many enterprises, and they consume many of the goods and services produced by these enterprises. I know from my own experience, growing up in urban Egypt, what it can mean to live in a low-income neighborhood. As young people, we were always torn between our desire to make things better on the one hand, and on the other hand, our lack of resources and inability to influence or even be informed about municipal and government affairs. In the absence of reliable services, we did things for ourselves. We removed the garbage that stood in rotten piles at street corners, we cleared away stagnant sewage water. We planted some trees. We looked for suitable land on which to play soccer after the only sports club serving the neighborhood was closed down, ostensibly for repair. Well, they shut it down in the mid-1970s, and when it opened 10 years later, they had started charging membership fees. The price of admission automatically excluded almost all the families in the neighborhood, including mine, from using what had been a public facility until then. But what really bothered us, what really bothered me growing up in that neighborhood was the unpredictability of it all. Being at the receiving end of decisions made by the powerful without warning and without explanation. We did not know why the water supply was cut even though we paid our bills on time. We did not know why the electricity supply was so weak that we needed to, step, to have step-up transformers for the fridge and the TV, and still the lights remained dim. Still, this was better than the total power outage and cuts, which struck frequently. And we did not know why it took 15 years to have a telephone line. I could go on and on about the unpredictability of living in a poor neighborhood or growing up in one. But I'm sure you see the simple point that I'm trying to make here, and which our report makes maybe much more eloquently than I'm trying to do. And that is that people who live in urban poverty can and should be involved in making decisions about issues affecting their life, 
Indeed, this is the right. Slums do disappoint those who only know about them from bad movies and from stereotypes. I was smiling to myself the other day as I was reading a book about Cairo by David Sims. Uh, it has a very interesting uh, title, Understanding Cairo, the Logic of a City Out of Control. And indeed, it's a city out of control. I mean, you cannot be under control when you have 19 million people and no infrastructure renewed for, for decades. He captured my feelings when he wrote, he's writing about the slums, and I quote him. Reading generalizations about Cairo's informal areas, one cannot but wonder if such negative images of the other serve as a necessary confirmation of the none other, that is, the modern middle and upper classes and the self-styled urban elites. They can feel good by objectifying slum-dwelling Kyrenes as backward. This gives them space to pontificate, which is for some an opportunity to indulge in a little charity work or to form an NGO." Unquote. Of course, much charitable work is a noble and generous undertaking. And NGOs can do, and they do, wonderful work. But what the urban poor need, what we needed when I was young growing up in that neighborhood, and what we deserved and what they deserve now beyond improved services delivery and as a prerequisite for improved services is inclusion. This means better information, better participation, and better representation. As the State of the World Children Report that we gathered here tonight to discuss points out, positive change follows when the excluded are no longer shunned, but instead granted the right to take part in local decision making. After all, who else is better and more qualified than them to help identify the challenges and to devise the solutions? I am encouraged to see that we have with us some young citizens from uh, New York, the city that has brought us all together from so many other countries and so many other cities around the states. Young people from this city that I, I love personally, they are here to give us a reality check. <laughs> I try to do that, but I'm like maybe 25 years older than them, so I'm sure theirs <laughs> is more up to date. But I would like also to recognize Commissioner Malgrave. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. From the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development, she is here in demonstration of partnership and, and commitment. I hope that you will leave this gathering all tonight after listening to the interesting uh, interventions from our colleagues here with many ideas of how you can include the rights of children in your work and in your life. Thank you. Thank you, Khaled. And next, a few words and an introduction on behalf of the New School from Michael Cohen, Director of the International Affairs Program. And I'd just like to acknowledge that the idea to hold tonight's event was planted many months ago by Michael, so thank you for bringing us together. Thanks very much. I'd just like to welcome everyone once again and to say that this, I think this evening really is a collective effort uh, from, from different institutions and different strong-willed people trying to make something happen. And uh, so it's, it's really great. From the New School, I think there are two issues that, that I just want to flag. One is this is really an example of theory and practice together. And it's, it's learning and it's application and it's looking at how things go in the real world. But it's also thinking about our city, New York, as an international place. And that really is the hallmark of our Milano School for International Affairs, Management and Urban Policy, to connect the international, the global, and the local. And this is where it happens, and that's what this report is all about. So welcome, and congratulations. Okay, so thank you, Dean Graboy, Professor Cohen, and Mr. Mansu, for your thoughtful introductions. We will now turn to the panel. 
Um, and as you can see, we have a number of panelists, all expert in different areas. And um, the panel was put together to also provide different perspectives. We have the perspectives of young people, researchers, practitioners, a representative from the New York City Mayor's Office, and also a representative from UNICEF. When we were putting this report together, the State of the World's Children, one of the themes that came out most strongly were the disparities that are found in urban areas between children from poorer households and those from wealthy households. And that was a very strong theme throughout. And although we mainly looked at countries in the developing world and middle income countries, um, such disparities exist everywhere, including here in New York City. So what better way to start tonight's panel than to have young people from New York City itself come and tell us about some of the challenges and opportunities they face in their daily lives. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome um, the youth group from the ATD Fourth World Movement, led by the wonderful Elise Caves. And I'd like to now introduce them um, one by one. So there's Esther Lambert, please come up. Estrella Gonzalez. Malcolm Smith. Maisha Prince. And Shakora Townsend. And they'll be joined by some of their friends as well. Okay, so over to these wonderful young people who have worked very hard to tell some extremely interesting stories. Good afternoon. My name is Esther. I'm 16 years old and I live in Carnacy, Brooklyn, New York. And my name is Estrella and I'm 17 and I live in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. We represent a group of people involved with ATD Fourth World Movement, an international nonprofit organization focused on poverty and human rights. Our group contributed an article to this year's State of the World's Children Report on our experiences growing up in New York City. The Youth Project brings together young people from under-resourced communities in New York City to speak about our lives and experience and advocate for change. It's a place where we gain confidence, learn, particular skills and express ourselves creatively. Throughout trips and events, we get a chance to see other people's realities and open our eyes to other communities and situations. To prepare for this presentation, we spent a lot of time in creative workshops and discussions. We talked about our lives and the things we want others to know about ourselves. Last week, the 13 of us took a retreat to Washington, D.C. To get, to get a fresh outlook on lives in, in New York. We're very proud to present this, and we hope that I will honestly will open your eyes. Growing up in New York City is part of who we are. We're proud that we're rising to the challenges, and we know that it's given us the kind of opportunities that others don't have access to. But there's more to us in the stories than meets the eye. And you need to know about us so that you can see how much we bring to the table. Hello, my name is Shakur Towns. I'm 15. Um, we are more driven than you give us credit for. People see kids who live in public housing or whose parents are on welfare or food stamps and think that we don't have any goals of our own. They are wrong. We are tired of being no one in life. When you are growing up in public housing and becomes part of what people see when they look at you. You and I are seeing each other for the first time here and listening to me, which I appreciate. But if we met in my neighborhood, you might be afraid of me, even though I act the same. I shouldn't have, be, I shouldn't have been defined where, I was, where I've been born at. Finding out that people are afraid of the place you call home is difficult. One of us was supposed to go on an outing with his teacher recently. She got his address and drove to pick him up. But when she, but when she, when she saw where she lived at, he lived at, she drove away. She was too afraid of the projects to even get out her car. I had experience that that makes me scared of my neighborhood too. One, once my cousin got into a fight 
with some boys in my area. Our family lived in a duplex building and our front door opened onto the same porch. That night they shot up a house. The next morning I went to school. I went to, I went to all, uh, I'm, no, sorry. All of us up here have something we want to accomplish with our lives. We want to go to college, have successful careers, and start families. Coming from our neighborhood, though, we have to work as twice as hard to achieve those goals. All of us know that for success would mean leaving people behind. Sometimes that's the price you have to pay for change, but it doesn't make the choice any easier. You, re you have to remember that young people like us have a role to play, even in difficult neighborhoods. There are options. By living through so many of the injustices relate to growing up in under-resourced community. We have gained knowledge. We have to start the process of change, change that will create places where all families are treated with respect and dignity. Speaking out about our lives is part of how we can start. People can speak for us who never had lived the lives we destroyed. But when we get to speak on behalf of ourselves and our own experience, that's a positive step. My name is Malcolm Smith, and I live in Brooklyn, um, Ocean Hill Projects. We are teenagers of color. It may seem like an obvious thing to say, but the combination affects us everywhere we go in the city. It's a hard thing to talk about sometimes, but the stereotypes that all different groups had towards us from teachers to police to strangers on the subway have to be discussed if we're ever going to move past them. Take a time, take a time to think about your first impression of me when I walked up on stage. Chances are your impression was affected by my age or the color of my skin. That's not okay. But if we don't acknowledge that it happens all the time, we can't get past it. I want you to see me for me, not for the categories I fall into, but I have to work twice as hard to overcome negative impressions and fears. A few weeks ago, for example, I was walking home from the store. It was raining, so I had my hood up, and I was walking fast. There were other people walking down the street, too, but when the Chinese food delivery man saw me, saw me coming, he literally stopped what he was doing and ran away, sprinted. Because a young black man was walking quickly towards him, the worst part is I, it didn't surprise me very much. I was used to being treated that way. Unfortunately, it's not just strangers like that who think the worst of us. People in position of authority, like adults, teachers, and the police, fall for the same stereotype. None of us would call the police an emergency given the choice. Because, of our, because our experience teaches us teach us that they, that they won't trust us. So why, should, so why would we trust them? We all have experienced police assuming we're in gangs or stopping and searching us for no good reason. Just last week, we were in Washington, D.C. preparing a speech and a policeman showed up in our car on the train. Just to watch in case the group of 12 teenage, teenagers of color, what? Went crazy, started a brawl, set the whole thing on fire, it's hard to show them they're wrong about us when they're too busy keeping us under control to listen. When you live in a city like New York, where, the, where first impression is all you ever make most of the time, it can take a toll. So many people think that if one teenager does something to them, all teens in New York City will do the same thing. We've, we feel constantly judged by the newsworthy bad apples that look or talk like us, or look like us, excuse me. And it makes us frustrated and angry. And how can you expect us to overcome the stereotypes that were loud, rude, or violent when so many people make it so clear that that's what they think of us? How many times do you expect us to respond to that kind of treatment without getting angry? As someone in our group said, you think I'm a violent person, but you're wrong. Hitting someone is a way of expressing my feelings because no one, wants, no, one's want, no one wants to listen to me when I speak. How is she supposed to change that if people just keep, assume, if people just keep assuming that that's true?
Um, good afternoon, my name is Lamisha Prince. And we, we are students of the New York City public school system. We all agree that having the opportunity to go to school is huge. A number of us are the children of immigrants who did not have the same opportunities in their countries, and we respect that. Still, many of us go to black high schools which are stereotyped as violent and hopeless or categorized by our own go government as failing. Having an opportunity and being able to take full advantage of it are two different things. When it comes to school, having support and encouragement from your family, teachers, and peers are crucial. Our families do all that they can and more, but when resources are scarce and unemployment is high, they often turn to us for support. We are proud that we can rise to the challenge of contributing to our families, but we have to recognize that extra responsibility has an impact on our academic performance. Support from teachers can be complicated too. Some teachers and guidance counselors go above and beyond for us and we recognize and respect when they do. Nevertheless, we've all experienced teachers who've given up on us before or getting to know us, ever getting to know us or whoever or who are so overburdened that they can't possibly do enough. One of our teachers, for example, started out as a homeroom teacher and by the end of the year, she was also teaching math and language arts because those teachers had quit. Even if she had given her 100%, it would be a third of what we needed. The most frustrating thing for me is when my teachers don't have time to answer or the energy to hear my input or my questions. The, thing, the third thing I mentioned that helps all, all of us to see is support from our peers, which is maybe the hardest of the three. Academic performance doesn't always get you a lot of respect in our communities. Those of us who work very hard in school are ridiculed and treated as elites, elitists. Violence and bullying in our school affect us deeply. It isn't a simple problem, though. One person in our group pointed out that people call him a bully, but he just wants to protect himself. Clearly, it's a cycle that takes more than just one person to stop, and acknowledging that is a first step toward changing it. For me, meditation is something that I found that helps stop that cycle. It keeps me focused despite all these distractions and helps me deal with frustration. Can you imagine how much the environment and schools would change if we brought something like meditation into schools? In fact, we all have the power to stop to fight bullying and violence. Look at the story of Angelo, a boy who was bullied badly because he was new and often showed up to school dirty. A girl in our group made a point of talking to him anyways, gave him someone to lean on, and eventually found out just how bad his home situation was. By reaching out to him, she made a difference and proved that people like us can choose to counteract the violence in our school. It takes courage and creativity, but it's possible. Well, I was just going to say it takes a lot of confidence to stand up here in front of such a big crowd, but it takes courage to do so and share such personal stories and do it so truthfully. So once again, please applaud Esther, Estrella, Shakora, Malcolm, Lamesha and their friends from the ATD Fourth Walk Movement. Okay, so this is a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, we're going to go into the discussion panel proper now, and each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes, and then at the end there will be opportunity for question and answer for about half an hour. Um, and the young people from the ATD Fourth Look Movement will also hang around and participate in the question and answer. So. Just um, letting you know so that you can start jotting down your questions and so on. So yes, a hard act to follow, but it is a good thing that our next speaker, in my opinion, has one of the sharpest intellects when it comes to studying children in urban areas. The next speaker is 
Mark Montgomery, and he is Professor of Economics at Stony Brook University and Senior Associate in the Poverty, Gender and Youth Program at the Population Council in New York. The title of Mark's topic is Locating Poor Urban Children, Where Do We Look? And where do we find you? <laughs> Yes, and as they say, and, and now for something completely different, right? <laughs> it's, uh, just a moment. Is this, is yes, this I, I think thing? I can. Let's see here. Okay. Great. Well, I hope all of you have either already had or will soon take the opportunity uh, to read this report. It is a uh, remarkable document. Um, it is a, a document that I, I'm hoping that arrives um, at just the right historical moment. Um, for so many years now, I think it will be surprising to, to many of you in, in the audience, um, the fact that there is poverty in, in cities, I'm speaking now in cities in, in poor countries, that for some reason, for uh, quite some time now, has, has been ignored or overlooked that poverty. And uh, that has meant that the situations of poor urban children in those situations have also been overlooked. I'm hopeful, even confident, that this volume will go a long way to opening eyes that should have been opened uh, long ago. Um, the, the situations of, uh, in particular, of poor urban children in the world's poor countries are made vivid in these pages. I think their lives are brought to life um, not perhaps quite as vividly as, as we've just heard, but to the extent that a, a printed volume can do so, um, uh, uh, these lives are vividly sketched in, in front of us. And I'm hopeful that policymakers and those who have the wel welfare, the well-being of children in mind, will read these stories, understand the issues, and finally uh, begin to act. Right? But if their eyes are opened, um, the next question would be, what, what is to be done? What, what should be done? And that's the uh, substance of my brief remarks. As we move from uh, a wonderful uh, map of, uh, of uh, the situations of poor children in cities around the world, um, can we put those children's lives more literally on the map so that programs uh, can understand where, where the children in need are and begin to reach them? So where do we look? Although, um, uh, I, so I will focus my remarks on uh, children roughly of, of, of your age, uh, young adults uh, of, of your age, um, uh, in part uh, because of some of the work that we have underway at the Population Council and investigating the lives of adolescent girls uh, in, in cities. Uh, but whatever the age uh, we choose to focus on, uh, uh, young adults or, or children, um, whatever programs we have in mind, they must, at, at the beginning, be able to identify those who are in need uh, in order to uh, reach them and then evaluate whether their efforts are successful or not. And of course, uh, if we think of uh, a city as complex as, as Cairo or uh, Lagos or many of the cities uh, uh, one can conjure up, um, uh, we, rec we recognize that these are great challenges indeed. The urban environments that we're considering are very complex. And so I'll, I'll leave you uh, with a few questions and only a few brief observations to help motivate these questions. Should we, as we consider um, the poor urban children of ages from zero uh, uh, well into adolescence and even young adulthood, should we be thinking mainly of those who are growing up in the world's large cities, the Kairos, the Lagoses, and, and so forth, of, the, uh, the, uh, of poor countries? Should we be thinking of those in need as um, being mainly uh, uh, children and young adults who've migrated in from the countryside? Are the children we have in mind uh, slum dwellers, if you don't mind the term? Um, is that where they're to be found? And then I'll try to summarize. So first, on the question of uh, in what sort of cities should we be uh, looking? Right? And it's almost inevitable, I think. It's almost irresistible to think, um, as the world's urban population grows and grows, 
uh, uh, billions uh, are to be added in, in the next uh, three or to four decades, uh, according to forecasts. It's, it's almost irresistible to think of that happening in the largest, most complex, vibrant, and uh, daunting uh, cities that we know of, uh, the Kairos, the Lagoses, and, and so forth. But in fact, that's not likely to be the situation. That's not where the vast majority of urban dwellers, ch children among them, live today, nor is it where they are likely to live in the foreseeable future. Yeah. Uh, though we hear much, and rightly so, about the situations of so-called megacities, the largest cities on the planet, 10 million and, and above in their number of residents, um, those cities only account for about one in eight urban residents. So somehow, we need to find a way to keep in our mind's eye the situations of the vast majority of the urban population of poor countries. Right? They are living not in the megacities, but in a myriad of smaller cities and towns, uh, which generally, as a rule, um, are disadvantaged relative to the larger cities in some respects. And this has proven to be a difficult thing for policymakers and researchers to do, to keep in mind the simple facts of, uh, of, uh, of urbanization. I ask, is it the case that uh, the young people with whom we're concerned, are they uh, likely to be migrants, in migrants uh, from the countryside? This um, graph gives you at least an indication um, of the proportions of uh, young, that is girls 15 to 19, who live in uh, cities in various countries, the proportion of, of those girls who have uh, recently migrated in. Okay. The uh, proportions range, or the percentages range from as high as one in four, okay? Uh, that would be Malawi at the uh, far right, uh, down to much smaller percentages. But certainly there are a number of countries in which appreciable percentages, uh, significant percentages of, of young urban women uh, have migrated to their current places of residence. And of course we expect that the vast majority of those uh, girls must have come from the countryside because don't we, already know that from our reading of the literature. And so we can ask the question, well, what does the evidence say on this point? Um, have we understood the situation correctly? Um, is it indeed the case that the vast majority of uh, urban uh, uh, residents, uh, girls and women among them, have migrated to their current places from the countryside? Um, the answer here, each dot is a, is a single survey. All right. um, the line of 50% is, uh, you can see there, and you see relatively few dots above the 50% line. Right? So it's much more common for these migrants to have come from other urban places, possibly smaller urban places, right? uh, over the course of their lives' journeys. Right? So this is not um, the impression one gleans from reading the literature about migration, who, migra who migrants are. But it's a, an empirical, uh, 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 fact, if you will, that will need to be kept in mind as we move from thinking about the urban child to action. Now, is uh, here's a, perhaps an overly academic way of asking the question, is urban poverty uh, spatially concentrated? That is, when we think of the poor uh, in urban areas, are we thinking in the colloquial sense of uh, those who live in slums, in, con in, 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 in communities of concentrated disadvantage? Is that uh, uh, where we find the poor? Right. Well, to answer the question, we would have to be clearer than we have been on what we mean when we say slums and how we would uh, know one when we saw one. Where, where are those places? Then we would have to answer two very basic questions to which we do not yet have even an approximate answer, despite what you might have thought. Um, what proportion of the urban poor live in slums? And what proportion of all slum residents are poor? Okay, two sides of a similar question. And then we have to ask further, if slums are indeed communities of a concentrated disadvantage, how long do children and, and others remain there uh, subject, uh, to the, uh, uh, subject to those disadvantages? Well, to the first question, um, uh, uh, do most of the urban poor live in uh, what we could ag uh, agree are, are slums? And the, the answer is simple, that we don't know. We might have thought we knew the answer, but in fact, if you look at the evidence, uh, there is very little evidence to be looked at. 
I've done a study with an Indian colleague suggesting that of all India's urban poor, one person in five lives in a slum. Now, I think that's doubtless uh, 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 quite an understatement, so let's make it two in five. Okay? That still would leave the proportion of slum dwellers at less than half. Right? And somehow, in our thinking, in our policies, in our, even our conceptions of urban poverty, we have not got fixed in our mind's eye the image of the urban poor who live outside slums. And of course, there are certain groups in which uh, I think many of you in this audience will be uh, especially familiar, whom uh, we know to be disadvantaged, socially isolated. I'm thinking of girls, adolescent girls who work um, and in domestic labor. Right? They work in homes that are not necessarily to be found in the slums, in somewhat better off uh, environments. Right? And so if we go only to the slums looking for these, these girls, we won't find enough of them. And finally, let me ask, uh, is residential mobility, again, a, a bit of an academic way of phrasing it, is change, leaving behind one neighborhood for another, is that a pathway out of poverty? Um, in places like the United States, we wouldn't dream of considering urban poverty at any length without at least raising the question of what about neighborhoods? If, if a young person leaves behind uh, a tough neighborhood, bad schools, danger on the street corner for a, a safer place, does that have lifelong consequences? We wouldn't dream of leaving that kind of question out of consideration. But in the literature on the cities in poor countries, there is shockingly little to be uh, seen on the question of, of residential mobility. So if we look down here at this uh, 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 little box that would divide up, uh, let's say, the, the all urban children in a poor country into those who live in slums, those who live elsewhere, those who are poor, and those who are not poor, we don't have anything close to the information to know what percentages to place inside those four boxes. And we don't know in particular how often uh, a, a girl, let's say, goes from being poor in a slum, changes a neighborhood to a non-slum setting, and sees an, an, an improvement in her life circumstances as a result. So we have, I, I, in short, a long way to go. As we uh, make the transition from uh, uh, a volume of this kind, which raises and vivifies the issues, to assembling the evidence that, on which we need to act, um, we need to set aside. Uh, these misconceptions of urbanization and urban poverty so that we're not misled. We need to find a way of keeping the smaller urban places in, in our minds as we devise policies and programs. We need to be careful about over-focusing on slums. And we need to give uh, attention to uh, migration and mobility. And I regret to say in my world of, uh, of demographers, uh, and even in the wonderful uh, mixed surveys that are the flagship uh, program of UNICEF, there is very, very little uh, to be had uh, by way of information on these central points. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mark, for painting another aspect of the reality of urban life. Um, the next panelist is one of this evening's organizers, Professor Alberto Minujin, from the Graduate Program in International Affairs here at the New School. Alberto is also the Director of Equity for Children. And the, his talk tonight, appropriately, will be discussing his research on intra-urban disparities in Latin America in, and the Caribbean. OK. Thank you very much for being here. It's really a pleasure for me, as Director of Equity for Children, to be with all of you. It's a pleasure of being with UNICEF doing this. I am a former UNICEF, so it's part of, I'm, in this moment, it's a, I'm unifying two identities. So, but let me say that it's very difficult to talk after you, young people. Yeah, really, because they bring what is the, the, the center of what we are trying to say. When you said how we can trust the people with authority, yeah? And how, and that's exactly what we are saying. We adults are the one with power. 
And the problem that we have is how to share our power. And people is more powerful, and they don't want to share. That's the problem that we have in this world. That's the problem all over the world. And you can see that in urban areas. Yeah, so I'm very happy. I congratulate UNICEF to bring in these uh, children in urban world, because for a long time, there were not too much around that. Also, last year was about adolescent girls, another big, big subject. So let me go to this, because I want to be short. But uh, the idea of equity, uh, I want to talk about something that very recently, because there is not much information about urban areas and children in urban areas, yeah, as you said. So we very recently finished an analysis for Latin America and the Caribbean, and I want to say something about that. But before that, I want to say something about equity and children in urban areas. <clears throat> We, let me very briefly to say the following. Around 2000, we start to discuss the question of child poverty. Why? Because people speak about poverty, and that's one of the, the points there, but poverty is income poverty. It's adult poverty. It's another power thing, yeah? We think on power, poverty, poverty is, is the adults, not the children. So we said, no, it's not income only is more, much more than income, yeah? It's multidimensional, but we need to go to that. And for children, certain things like care, school, relations, that's the important things, yeah? So we start to work on that, and also we wrote something called Mind the Gap. Mind the Gap means that many countries were saying, we achieved the goal, that was the time of the goal for children, 99, 2000, a lot of countries come and say, we achieved the goals. I said, ah, you achieved the goal for whom? For the rich people, but not for the poor. Yeah. So in that moment, 2006, we start with equity for children. When we discussed the name, we said, let's put to this initiative and program at the new school, equity for children, because equity is a central point. So. Um, the point, and that's why I think that it's important, urban, the urban world, is that usually when we work with poverty, all the time people are saying rural poverty is the worst situation. I agree, it's a very bad situation. But what happened is we use average in the urban areas. We don't look beyond the average. So in that case, I think that uh, is important, and that's why poverty and disaggregation in urban areas is very, very important. I think that your point on Islam is very important because it's not only the Islam. We need to look at much broader sense of that. So, basic in what? Fairness. Fairness and social justice. We want another world. We want another world for everyone, for the adults, for the young people, for everyone. So social justice is the main point. Uh, I want to mention something that I think that is important. There are two, I think that we need to think on two kinds of inequalities. One is vertical inequalities. That is the one that usually people think about. Income, level of education, that kind of things that are very important. But there is another that is called horizontal inequalities that is basically discrimination. Groups that can have similar income, but they are discriminated. Why? Because of religion, because of being girls, because of their ethnic questions, yeah? Because of where they live, yeah? So a vertical, horizontal inequalities are very powerful mobilizers for people. I was doing very recently a work about uh, inequity in Middle East. Yeah? And thinking, I was thinking when he was talking about uh, Cairo and Egypt, 
I work a lot there. And you can see that the mobilization in big part of the Middle East is related with horizontal inequality. And the people is mobilized because of that. So the framework that I would like to convey you to have in mind is the following. We have two sources of inequality. Yeah? One is what is material deprivation. And the other is the idea of discrimination. So one is what we can call child poverty, multidimensional child poverty. The other is the, the idea of exclusion. The point is that all these things are overlapping. So if you have some material deprivation and you are discriminated, you are joining things that at the end you are among the poorest of the poorest and in the exclusion areas. The problem is that we don't have much information about this. Much, we don't have too much information on this, but we have practically no information on that. When I work on uh, Middle East, the, we need to gather information from other sources and not from mix and that kind of thing. So let me go one second to Latin America. We use 25 uh, surveys there. But one of the big problems is how we work and define the, uh, the question of inequity and disparity in the surveys, given that we, don't, we cannot go for areas. Yeah? So we use right, the idea of right, household, to have a good household, or at least the basic things at the household, income poverty, and education. And we built a sort of matrix of different level of deprivation. Highly deprived, more and non-deprived. And we estimate the, the ratio between one and the other, what is called the relative gap. So I will show you only two results, and I will finish. This is only to, you can have an idea. This is immunization, one of the basic things. Very interesting. The gap between rural and urban areas, there is, not a, there is no gap. Yeah? That is to say, for example, <laughs> Bolivia. 10% of kids are not immunized. Immunization is one of the basic. Yeah? However, the same proportion is in the rural and the urban area. When we go to, to the urban areas and we go to the one that live in the most the private area, there is almost two, that is the difference, 100% between one group and the other. Duplicate the kids no immunizers are the doubles in that area than in the other areas. <laughs> this is adolescent pregnancy, 15 to 19 years old. Also, the gap is very extreme. This is what you have here is the, in the top, the highly, the private group, and the less the private group. Yeah. So it's almost two times. And it's not shown here, but it's much more stronger, the gap inside the urban areas than between urban and rural areas. So going to the, I don't, the final observations, I think that uh, we need to work much more and have much more information on intra-urban uh, inequalities. Vertical and horizontal inequalities are important. We need to, to have information about that, but we need to act on that. And I think really working, because I work a lot on, on areas, on poor areas in, in urban, um, that living in an urban area, and every one of you know, it's an opportunity because we, you have many things. You have all the things that in rural areas you don't have. But at the same time, it's a big, big risk. Big risk. 
and very difficult to live in the urban area. So, children's equity in urban areas matters. That's the main and the big conclusion that I have. But I want to say something that I think that is, and I want to finish with that. Uh, we can go we, we can go with soft policies. The one that, we, if we don't challenge seriously the power of the one that are very rich, the power of the powerful, and we go with very soft things, we can act. However, my big question is how much you can act if you don't try to redistribute in a more stronger way. Uh, and I think that the point, the main challenge, is to try to change what is the injustice of distribution first, second, the injustice of recognition, and finally, the injustice of representation that for children, the voice of children as recognition and representation is a clear thing. So, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Alberto. We're going to slightly change modes now and look at the way how research findings can be applied in a more practical manner to work with children in urban areas. Dr. Pamela Reed, who is co-director co of the Children's Environments Research Group at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, will discuss the Child Friendly Cities Initiative and how to plan cities with and for children. And we hope that this approach will be of particular interest to the urban planners in the audience. Pamela? Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here, Nicola. It's a privilege. I'm here on behalf of uh, also my colleague who co-directs the research center with me at the CUNY Graduate Center, Roger Hart, who's uh, done a lot of work on children's participation in the planning and design of cities. And uh, I'm thrilled here uh, to be here today to talk to you about um, some of the initiatives that UNICEF uh, has been working on as solutions to a lot of the issues that have been identified. So. You know, what can we do to take these ideas forward and to really make an impact with local authorities? And so what I'm going to talk about is the Child Friendly City Initiative uh, and movement um, and uh, as a process-based solution to the complex, integrated, and evolving problems that we have in urban communities and how young people can contribute their voices to those processes. I want you to think of a time when you were between the ages of eight and 18, or however old you are now, in, the, in that age range, and think, what, how, did you, how did you contribute to your community when you were growing up, or your city? What did you do? Think of an image in your head. I want you to think of something that you did to contribute to your community or to your city as a young person. Was this the image that you had in your head? No. Did anyone have this image? Just out of curiosity. Oh, you. Great. What? Right? Yes, I did have that. Well, you are very unique. Um, but this is a vision that um, exemplifies what a child friendly city could be, um, even with younger children than the ones that were here today. Because childhood, we need to think of the full spectrum of how young people contribute to their communities, very young children, all the way up to the ages of 18. This is an example of a children's council in France 
where young people get together on a, a regular basis to discuss uh, issues that the mayor or other local authorities want input from young people on. And so this is a common practice, children's councils around the world. They're in Turkey, they're in France, they're in the Dominican Republic. Um, and we even have you know, mayoral youth councils in uh, cities in the United States as a mechanism for children to express their opinions about what they want and how their communities are designed. And um, another example is just to think about what goes on in the spaces that children frequent every day, their schools, uh, the neighborhood parks. How can young people contribute to um, their ideas to the design of services for their health care, for their, uh, their well-being in community-based organizations and early childhood care centers? And so the child-friendly cities and communities model is really trying to provide a vision for what that can look like. And this vision is rooted in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. I have to say this every time I give this presentation in the United States because we all know that, well, maybe we don't, that the United States and Somalia are the only two countries in the world that have not ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so it's really great to have this conversation occur here in the United States. Um, this convention outlines uh, minimum standards for children's well-being, protection, and development. And so what the child-friendly city movement is about is taking those rights that have been framed at the national level and trying to bring it down to the local level so that children's rights are realized. So a child-friendly city is a city that's committed to a process for the realization of children's rights. And UNICEF has done some great work around what this might look like. So what's a top-down approach? What can local authorities, um, commissioners, city agencies, mayors, uh, uh, mayors do to help make their city child-friendly? There's the nine building blocks. And at the core of it is children's participation, their voice in, in concerns and matters. Uh, for young people. It also could entail having a child-friendly legal framework, uh, a system of cross-sectoral planning for children. So the Department of Transportation and the MTA is talking and communicating with the Department of Education and the Department of Youth and Community Development, and everyone is kind of coming to a consensus about what needs to happen with children's participation in these domains. So people have talked about data. We need to have data that express young people's opinions in a way that local authorities can also feel comfortable acting on it. We hear these great stories, um, but I think local authorities would also like to have some data, some real hardcore information about what percentage of the population feels the same way that you do, you know? Um, and so UNICEF is also trying a bottom-up approach by d helping um, to develop toolkits that enable young people to lead assessments, child rights assessments of their communities and their schools themselves. And I want to give you a couple of examples of, of what that has looked like. Um, the Child Friendly Communities Toolkit that's available on a website I'll share at the end of my presentation is a participatory assessment process that uses visual uh, medium for young people to rate their rights in their community, and it covers all topics of children's rights because it's directly related to the CRC. So healthcare, education, urban planning, parks and recreation, all of that. And brings young people together in small group sessions to rate their rights collectively using large charts and stickers, and then to collectively analyze the information right there on the spot with young people to have young people collect the data, analyze the data, and interpret it themselves, rather than experts like us gathering the data through surveys, taking it back to our office, manipulating the data, and coming back. It's about the democratization of data, information, and gathering and sharing for advocacy purposes. So because it's visual, children that do not know how to read or young people that are re-entering education for the first time can participate in these assessments as well. And this toolkit has been used in 12 countries around the world, including the United States, and uh, I'll get to that in one moment. But this just gives you an example of how it can be adapted locally. And this is in a more rural setting, but uh, in Sudan, where the basic concept of the toolkit was 
manipulated and adapted to be culturally appropriate. So new images were drawn and local materials to produce these visual charts for analysis like rocks and stones are used instead of paper that we have and we, we can use in the United States context. These initiatives have led to increased awareness of children's rights among children themselves, which is really important because young people cannot read the Convention on the Rights of the Child and understand what that means in their everyday world unless they go through a process of translating that and talking about it. So we were thrilled when the US Fund for UNICEF also wanted to initiate this process in the United States. And I'd like to acknowledge Mariama Barry, if you can stand, as one of the youth participants of this program who took the time out of her busy schedule to come here tonight, as well as Ralph Figaro, who is filming me back there, um, who was uh, a youth uh, teaching artist in the program. It, we partnered with the Isaac Center um, and a teen action program, which is a, a program that uh, Commissioner Mulgrave's uh, office is in charge of. So we hope to shine some good, uh, positive uh, outcomes for what the great work uh, is going on here in New York City. So this program, again, used the toolkit, trained young people how to facilitate the child rights assessment, and then to take action on the issues that were identified through that assessment. Um, it was a global education program in the sense that the youth that implemented this UNICEF toolkit in Brazil, video conferenced with us in New York and trained the youth in New York how to run the assessment in the sense of letting them know what kind of issues they might run into because the assessment covers the full age range of children between the ages of zero and 18. So how, how can young people work with other young people who are even younger than them to facilitate this awareness? Uh, we integrated video and technology. That's why Ralph is here. He was also very instrumental in helping the young people take action because the results show that 0% of the children in East Harlem that we worked with, and there were 70 that the young people worked with um, in a period of six months, which I think is pretty amazing, um, zero had heard about their rights. It's not being taught in school. 95% of the children um, said that the government doesn't ask their opinion about their community. 76% of the children said that they fear that they can, uh, a stranger can take them away. So these are really important key issues that then the Teen Action Program took action on. And they created a film, um, I'll show you the link in a little bit, that is essentially raising awareness about children's rights for an American audience. and providing the results of street interviews and all of the data that they collected. So now we have information that local authorities uh, feel comfortable acting on because it's, it's hard data, it's statistics that's that are valid and reliable and come from young people themselves. Um, so that film has uh, won an award by the Broadway Freedom of Expression Contest, uh, sponsored by the New York Civil Liberties Union. And I just, again, want to acknowledge Ralph and, and Mariama for making that available. And it's available on their blog, so everyone can look at it, because the whole goal was to educate others about their rights in order for young people to take action on their rights. Um, and more recently, we have partnered with UNICEF ed Education Section to translate this toolkit for a child rights assessment and focus it on the school environment. And in particular, schools in countries that are transitioning from human conflict or natural disaster. And I want to acknowledge Carlos Vasquez, who is the architect working for UNICEF Child Friendly Schools, who brought to our attention the poor quality of transitional learning spaces or these temporary schools that are built to last for a short period of time after a natural disaster to enable as many children as possible to return to school and even new children who have never been enrolled in school to return. So we've uh, adapted the toolkit for schools that could be used even in non-emergency situations. And again, uses a really visual uh, process to engage young people to lead the assessment themselves of their schools with their peers and to form a committee that then acts on how to, to, to take action on those, those results. This is just an example of a newer version of the assessment toolkit, which is now a booklet. Um, using flashcards and the large charts and markers. And young people score uh, and do a group vote. You know, in transitional learning spaces, the average ratio is uh, one to 50, one teacher to 50 students. You see that the young people are still 
attending schools in tents two years after the earthquake in Haiti. Two years, okay, they are still in tents. And the wood school is only designed to last five years. So what that means is that there's gonna be a post-humanitarian aid aftershock in five years time where all of these transitional schools are gonna deteriorate and the government doesn't necessarily have the capacity to build new schools in that short amount of time. So what are we, we're gonna have another earthquake but it'll be silent. So all of this to say that young people can lead assessments about their rights, they can generate valid, reliable data that administrators, mayors, researchers can count on, um, and that data can be displayed in child-friendly formats, as well as in formats that d adults feel comfortable making decisions on. And it disaggregates data. It lets you see what are the girls saying versus the boys, what are the young children versus the older children saying. And what's, an, what's the average uh, desire of the community uh, or the school to act? And I am been asked to conclude, so I will give you three very practical websites where these toolkits are housed, um, as well as the link to the youth in Harlem and their video, Future Building a Future in EastHarlem.wordpress.com. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Commissioner Jeannie Mulgrove, almost needs no introduction because she has been referred to so yeah. much. It shows just how pleased we are that you were able to join us. And um, I'd like to thank you for joining us at such short notice. Um, the Commissioner was very kind to um, join us only last week and um, prepare in that short time. So Commissioner Jeannie Mulgrove is from the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. And I think having someone like the Commissioner on the panel is integral to this conversation um, because you can provide a municipal perspective on the challenges and opportunities encountered when planning and designing cities for and with children. So over to you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Um, is this on? I think, can you hear me? Great, great. Um, I'm really uh, delighted to be here and thank you, Nicola, for that uh, very, very kind introduction. I'm here with Kathleen Collins, who is my Deputy Chief of Staff, and also Dr. Bob Franzobera, who uh, writes many of our solicitations. And thank you for having government in the room. It's a little daunting, uh, but I'll do, I'll do my best uh, to answer for, for uh, not only New York City government, but government officials in, in general. Uh, it was so wonderful to hear uh, and start out with hearing from our young people. Um, part of what they are saying to us is that they want to be respected. And by having them go first and really lay the foundation for our discussion, I think um, we um, had a chance to both respect them and also to hear them. And I thank them for their poise and for their remarks. Uh, much of um, what we do is really to get guidance from young people uh, because we are not spending our money well, um, which, which is really your money, um, unless we get guidance from young people. I have the privilege of leading the Department of Youth and Community Development. I have been in this role since uh, 2002 and serve at the ple pleasure of um, Mayor uh, Bloomberg. And um, that agency has really, as, as its core mission, um, serving young people and families. And so, of course, this uh, workshop um, and panel is, is really very close to my heart. Uh, not all of you uh, are familiar with the Department of Youth and Community Development. We affectionately call it DYCD. Um, one of the things that I want to stress is that um, New York City is really an aberration in having such uh, a municipal agency. I'm talking about a government agency that is, um, is focused on the youth development needs of young people uh, outside of school. Uh, obviously, um, almost every uh, municipality is going to have a Department of Education, but we're talking about um, you know, what happens after school. We're talking about youth workforce development, uh, literacy, services for runaway and homeless youth, uh, and community service or service mm -hmm. learning. And, um, and that is uh, something very, very uh, special. 
Um, we do our work through community-based organizations, or NGOs, as, as you call them. Uh, we're smart enough to know that um, government shouldn't be doing these direct services and that we should really rely on folks on the ground that, that really know better. Um, our processes are, are transparent and competitive, and, so, um, and that's really to ensure that we have fairness and accountability in how we distribute uh, money. And we distributed about $324 million uh, last year um, through about uh, 1,300 distinct organizations and 2,600 contracts. And we have um, the distinction in New York City government to have the largest number of human services contracts in the city of New York, although probably my agency is relatively small compared to other agencies you might be familiar uh, with. Um, the, the other fortunate thing that New York City has is um, a very sophisticated uh, nonprofit infrastructure. We have about 40,000 nonprofits here in the city of New York, uh, many of whom have been operating for more than 100 years. And it's that tradition that I think helps us meet the needs of a very diverse uh, and, and culturally and linguistically diverse uh, community and do that well. Um, the unifying principles of, that drive DYCD are very similar to what we've heard here today, which are uh, equity, accountability, <clears throat> and maximizing community engagement. And so by emphasizing these principles, um, we're able to make sure that our resources are really going where they're needed most, um, and also that we are supporting um, high quality programming. I was particularly struck by the overlap between some of the approaches um, we have taken here in New York City and the themes and recommendations in the State of the World's Children 2012 report. Um, first and foremost was the need to really understand the scale and nature of poverty affecting children. And as you probably know, um, in 2006, uh, the mayor established um, and uniquely established uh, the commission um, to look at poverty in New York City called the Center for Economic Opportunity to really make sure that we understood uh, the extent of poverty and then to take those steps that would be necessary to combat uh, poverty. And they, that report and that commission really focused on three critical groups, including young children, uh, young people ages 16 to 24, and uh, working adults. And uh, many pilots um, came out of that commission report in 2006. Um, many are not here today, but I'm proud to say that the three that we were funded for are still here, and one of them is Teen Action. So um, I really credit the mayor for allowing us to do that innovative work, which I think uh, so nicely captures uh, youth voice, um, and, and more importantly, not only youth voice, but youth action. Um, we also um, are very focused on removing the barriers um, uh, to inclusion, and whether that means that we um, have free services, which all the services that come out of my agency are free, or whether that means that we use lotteries so that um, very transparent processes, so everybody is really starting in the same place, or whether that means that we have, as part of our solicitations, um, special sections that really um, focus on young people who may not have been served well um, by, uh, by government in the past. Young people with disabilities, those aging out of foster care, court-involved youth, LGBTQ youth, et, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the last, uh, one of the, the last areas of prioritizing the needs of children, um, which um, I'm proud to say that New York City spends about a third of its money in its uh, budget for youth-related services, um, and that we were um, recognized by the America's Promise as being one of the 100 best communities for young people. Um, we've had that distinction for four years now. Uh, and then the, the area, of course, of community participation and uh, community engagement, again, um, really goes to the crux of, of what we do. Just a very, very um, quick um, snapshot um, in terms of um, young people here in New York City. As you know, um, our, our um, population keeps growing here in New York. It's because of immigrants, and immigrants bring youthfulness, and we like that. Uh, and we have about 8.4 uh, million um, people here in the city. 
about 1.7 million are young people under 18, and about a million are 18 to 24-year-olds, with two-thirds um, either being born here or being um, a second generation. Uh, well, um, we are hopeful that the recovery is, is uh, well beyond uh, us. Um, we know that the 2008 recession has really taken a toll on New York City with one in five um, New Yorkers living in poverty. And of course, the poverty rate among children is, has uh, risen to about 30%. Um, and then, you know, when we look at specific areas, including um, specifically the Bronx, uh, it's at 40%. I'm going to just move along. Um, we, thankfully, um, with, um, with uh, our poverty rates and also our, our some of our hung homeless rates and our hunger rates, um, we, we do have some good news uh, to report. And, and most of that is in the area of our um, rising uh, graduation rates. And um, I'm, I'm pleased that since um, 2003, um, we have really seen a narrowing of the gap um, between uh, black and Latino youth and white and their white and Asian uh, counterparts. Um, clearly, it is not where we want it uh, to be. I was with the chancellor this afternoon. He admits that it is not where we want it to be. The mayor says every day that it's not where uh, we want it to be. But um, the good news is that we are seeing um, an increase. Uh, we still have too many young people who here in New York City who are disconnected, uh, not at work and not um, in school. And, um, um, and as, as we heard from our young people, um, although I, um, I know that we have a safer city, um, we still have to look at violence, which is pl plaguing um, you know, many, many, many of our communities, particularly gun violence. And I know the mayor has been uh, at the forefront of leading other mayors to, uh, to look at um, protections um, against gun violence. Um, my, my agency's role is uh, to prepare children to become active, engaged uh, citizens and to reach their uh, potential. Um, through, um, in terms of, of, of equity, we have really used uh, data available to us to make sure that um, our resources are really going where they should, where they should be invested. And so uh, origi originally, when I assumed my role, uh, we had a, a disconnect between um, where poverty was and where we, where we were spending our money. And so if we don't have enough dollars, which we will never have enough money in the city's budget or any, any municipal budget, we want to make sure that those resources are really targeted. And uh, we, uh, um, it's probably no surprise to you that we were overrepresented in Manhattan. Uh, and um, although there was nobody undeserving, I must say, who got those resources in Manhattan, we knew that um, if we were looking for poverty, it was you know, but mostly in the Bronx. If we were looking for high dropout rates, they were mostly in the Bronx. If we were looking for the largest um, pregnancy rates, uh, teen pregnancy rates, they were in the Bronx. And so um, we really needed to adjust. Um, uh, the way we gave out money. And so we began to um, look at poverty data, youth population, English language learners, uh, single parent um, households, um, and right size uh, what we were doing. Accountability is also very, very critical to what we do. Uh, we work very closely with our CBO partners to provide capacity building and technical assistance and making sure that we are strengthening and coaching them to, um, to deliver high quality uh, services and community engagement. engagement. And um, I had a whole section on that, but I, I didn't realize that uh, the time would go so quickly. Um, and teen action was at least covered, um, but we um, really go through a lot of effort to make sure that we are getting surveys from young people, that we're doing focus groups, that we are getting feedback on our uh, concept papers, that we are changing them to reflect that, uh, and we continue to cha change because, it, again, if nobody uh, if nobody shows up to our programs, it's not money well spent. And so I look forward to, the, to, um, uh, to answering some of your more specific questions. And thank you again for including me.
Okay, last but certainly not least, uh, representing UNICEF and providing an overview of some of UNICEF's work in urban areas is Robert Jenkins, officer in charge of the, the Division of Policy and Practice here at UNICEF headquarters. Okay, um, as you've heard, uh, we each had 12 minutes, but one of the common themes from the five of us has been the importance of community engagement. So I'm gonna give 10 of my minutes back. Um, and I, I'll, honestly, I think between Mark and Alberto's strong plea for the importance of understanding where uh, the poorest live and for us to unpack data, um, Pamela's great. Uh, uh, presentation around uh, child-friendly cities and thanks for all the positive words about UNICEF and I can't uh, say enough about what Jean had just mentioned and uh, UNICEF fully agrees with this equity accountability and community engagement so there's not a lot that I would be adding value to by continuing along all these themes other than to endorse what has been said and I can't even begin to uh, appreciate to acknowledge how um, phenomenal the introductory comments from our, our youth colleagues so Seeing that it's about community engagement, I think it's important for those of us who are less youthful to also uh, <laughs> step back and engage. Um, there is a couple of, uh, what is the solution? Where do we go? There were some slides um, and there's in the report, it highlights um, where are some best examples, some best cases that we can take forward in other countries. There's a phenomenal one in um, Brazil called the Municipal SEAL Program that many of us are familiar with and UNICEF has supported. I would encourage us to read that and think a little bit more about how that can be scaled up in other countries. It does, it has managed to tweak the accountability and, and dialogue around uh, these issues and, and has made a very tangible difference. Um, UNICEF, my last message is, I think we're looking at needing a critical mass or a tipping point. And maybe today, as Mark had said, maybe today is the beginning of a new era of working in urban areas, of development organizations like UNICEF, but also the good work that takes place in, in um, wealthier countries. And we obviously would just be one small part of working with all of you and many others outside this room to, to sort of generate this critical mass to um, address the imbalances and inequities that are very apparent in, uh, in the world today around poor kids living in urban areas. So we fully endorse everything that's been said and look forward to engaging with all of you further. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Robert, for that, and apologies for your PowerPoint no not working, but um, you did very well without it. Um, okay, so we have now concluded the formal part of the discussion panel, um, and soon we will open up the floor for the question and answer session. Um, there are... Don't come and line up just yet, but I'll just explain the, the rules. So there are a couple of microphones, and when you come up to line up, please introduce yourself, state your affiliation, and um, say to whom your question is directed. And then if you have a comment to make, that's fine, but please keep it brief. So um, ask brief, pointed questions, um, and and um, the panels, panelists will be happy to answer them. Um, I'd like to ask Samantha and Meisha from the ATD Fourth World Movement to come and sit on the panel as well. No, 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 over here. <laughs> so you get my seat and um, I'll get you. Should I? Okay. Um, now, to, to start off the question and answer session, I'd like to invite my colleague Sue who is also part of the research team on the State of the World's Children, and who is acting as discussant tonight, to summarise what has been said, highlight some of the key points, and then begin the question and answer session with a few questions. So, thank you, Sue. Thanks, Nicola, for setting the stage for our upcoming discussion. I want to begin by thanking the members of the panel for weaving together this rich tapestry of stories, experiences, 
research and program that speak to major issues confronting children, young people, and their families living in urban areas here in New York and also abroad. We started off through a panel discussion with a moving account from the youth of ATD Fourth World Movement on their experience growing up in low income neighborhoods in New York City. They gave voice to their struggles, sharing how they challenged stereotypes, overcame obstacles, and even helped others in similar situation. Professor Mark Montgomery followed with a presentation on the challenges of locating poor urban children. Through his research, we get a better understanding of the complexities in identifying urban, poor urban children and following them over time in assessing the benefits of pro-poor interventions. And he specifically challenged us to overcome some of our misconceptions of slums and where urban children are found. Then Pamela Ritt from the Children's Environment Research Group talked about child-friendly cities, an international initiative that emphasized the importance of including the best interests of children and youth at the center of urban planning. She shared how the CFC initiative can be incorporated into urban design and management, but also adapted to the local context. <laughs> Professor Alberto Munahind, I hope I pronounced it right. Oh, right <laughs> Sorry. Uh, discussed the importance of equity in the urban debate on children. <laughs> Using national data sets from Latin America and the Caribbean, fantastic analysis, I must say. And I'm also a data geek, so <laughs> mind you. <laughs> he showcased the intra-urban disparities and exclusion experienced by so many poor and marginalized children and adolescents. <clears throat> Commissioner Mulgrave talked about the nature and scale of poverty affecting youth in New York City. She discussed how the New York Department of Youth and Community Development is assisting and serving as well as supporting youth particularly those who are from low-income families and disadvantaged backgrounds, to overcome their struggles and experiences. Um, I particularly found it very interesting that the core mission is to focus on development, youth development outside of the school and working with, in collaboration with NGOs, CBOs, community-based organizations. Because I myself used to come from that background in Toronto when I was doing community development work. And the panel closed with Robert Jenkins endorsing what has been said by other panelists and also sharing some of the UNICEF's focus, um, urban focused programming, such as the municipal seal and others. So that's, I hope I've done justice to some of the panelists in our, my summary. But I also want to move on to some of the discussion questions I have before you. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I did do some community work in Toronto. And as someone who used to work with immigrant youth, um, I am interested, so this question is to uh, members of the ATD, what, what you would recommend to others growing up in similar situations? And then, <laughs> I've, I've, should I ask all the questions now or yeah, should? So think, about your think, think about your answers and then I'm going to. Secondly, I noticed that the common thread that weaves through all these presentations is the challenges associated with living in the cities for many poor and disadvantaged children. So it's quite a heavy topic. So having said that, I like to balance the perspective and the tone and ask members of the panel to share what they think are the advantages of living in cities for children and young people. And thinking about those advantages, how can we expand and build on these advantages? So the th and now the third question I have is now that we know what we know, what needs to happen next to improve the lives of the most disadvantaged children and youth in cities around the world? What should be the top priorities for policymakers? And what Mark has mentioned are those who work for the welfare of children, what do they need to think about in planning their next step? And if we have time, this is just my personal favorite question. <laughs> uh, we know how important data is to the urban debate. So my question to some of the urban data <laughs> experts, how can we make it, urban data, how can we make it the forefront of policy and practice? Thank you very much.
Okay, so thank you, Sue, for that. So over to the discussion panel, and um, I'd like to invite LaMaysha and Samantha to answer the first question. So um, advice to young children growing up in an urban city um, would be coming from me is to have an open mind, always be like determined to, of what you want. Also, um, be considerate that what you want is not always what other people want. So you, you, you're gonna have to leave behind like a, a few people, but not totally behind, but you, you have to reach for your goals at the same time. So if no one can understand that, then you can only be focused on you and yourself. And that's, that's just basically the number one rule for when you want something. Sorry, um, my opinion is basically, if you're in an urban setting and there's all kind of alternatives or there's certain ways you can go about finding mm -hmm. something that can benefit you, that you should go for it. If it benefits you in a good way and if it's also educational and it helps you survive your elements, then you should go for it 100%. You shouldn't have to worry about what friends say, family say, because if they're truly interested and they want you to grow, then they wouldn't have a problem with it. Like, knowledge is power, but only if you use it. If you don't use it, then basically it would be a waste of time to not take what's out there, what's available to you. Um, oh. and also, to, um, um, also going back to not every, everyone's not gonna be looking at certain things that you have left, that you see. Um, I said to be open-minded, meaning to also respect the negative out the like the negative views on certain people because you never know why they view what they see. So um, you should just take time to um, actually involve people into what you're doing. And that's how you know if, if a person is really considered about your ideas or sincere about what you want. want. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Mark, would you like to be the next to answer some of the questions about data and so on? It's interesting that you thought of me in that context. Um, I, I would like to um, raise the word mapping, uh, in part because I think this is one of the things that it makes New York City in recent years a very interesting model to consider in other contexts. You know, we, think, we can think of maps, uh, data placed on maps. A, a map is an object, but that's not really the important aspect. It's how one arrives at a map, how different city agencies with different responsibilities, different histories, and, and uh, no doubt uh, different ways of viewing the world, in order to see each of, um, of their agencies, uh, each of these agencies represented on a map, a process must be put in motion where the agencies come together, they compromise, they collect, uh, they synthesize. So it's a feat of, I suppose, uh, bureaucratic and uh, political will, right? To make a map um, is a, a, a way of describing engagement that cross cuts, that goes across uh, a, a number of, of city agencies. And so the final product, as we've seen in New York City, is. Um, extremely useful and I and so that we can know very clearly that the Bronx is disadvantaged in all these all these dimensions and that perhaps other boroughs uh, maybe even Manhattan has its uh, areas of disadvantage but it's less the final product um, uh, than the process that that delivers that final product that is so valuable and which we do not, it does not happen spontaneously it's not an organic uh, uh, sort of thing that that uh, materializes in every city it has to in some way be made to happen. And that's why I think the model here has been uh, so remarkable, that to show that it can happen in a, at a very contentious uh, in, in environment in, in many respects, that uh, should be a signal, I think, to cities uh, around the world uh, to begin to, be, to engage in the same way. Albert, do you have something to add to that? Okay, very briefly, I want to take this, uh, the point of uh, top 
pri priorities because you talk about uh, information that is my my area but i want to talk about the priorities i think that the basic things we need to cover the best basic rights that is basic social services but i think that these inequities what i call horizontal inequities is one of the big priorities and one of the way of changing modifying that is power i think that the voice of adolescent and young people. But the voice, you have a voice if someone listens. Yeah? If when you say something, something happens. If not, it's opinion. So I think that we need to do something very, and you show some, some very way, some way of doing that. So it's not, I'm not talking about something that, well, is very, it's a ideal maybe in, 100 years we can do it. No, there are places that people is doing that. So let's do okay. Great. I'll let you add whatever you like. Uh, urban problems are not static. They're not um, unidimensional. They're evolving and complex. And therefore, what I would like to say is that the top priority for urban government should be putting processes in place that enable young people to articulate their priorities, like the examples that I showed today, uh, as a basis for decision making, as a way for young people to advocate their rights uh, with uh, data that comes from young people themselves. Uh, that's one thing that I want to say. And the other thing I want to say is that we also need to be really mindful that even in the poorest communities, there are extreme assets. There are great assets. And what the Child-Friendly Community Toolkit does, it not only allows young people to identify priorities, but it also allows communities to celebrate the assets that they have. Because in many poor communities, the social networks are key to the livelihood strategies of, of young people growing up there. And there's a great degree of wealth and assets that need to be mobilized for young people. We need to recognize and change the stereotypes that people have about young people growing up in poor communities of one that's an asset, not something to be avoided. Thank you. That, very well said. Uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons why um, we embarked on a program with the New York City Housing Authority. Uh, they have these lovely <coughs> um, community centers and they have the infrastructure, if you will, and the bricks and mortar, uh, and we have the program development experience. And so what a beautiful marriage. Um, and back in 2009, uh, we um, took over 25 of those um, community centers in the New York City Housing Authority, uh, f um, uh, New York City Housing Authority facilities, um, to really bring uh, those places to be vibrant places, places that um, did incorporate uh, youth voice, uh, and each of those has a youth council uh, where young people are deciding which activities are important to them. They're establishing. Uh, the themes that are important to them. So for some, it could be, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur. For others, it could be, um, you know, green jobs. Uh, for others, it could be uh, more artistic. Um, the full, really, the full gamut. But um, they're able to really explore what are their gifts and what, you know, how can they make a contribution. And I think we have an obligation um, to help them really get to a place where they have 21st century um, skills. Um, I am you know, always um, disappointed that more of our young people aren't given the opportunity to write, to express themselves, to be analytical, to question, uh, because those are the things that I had the privilege of learning in my college career. And, and it makes, and in, in high school, I came uh, actually born and raised on Lower East Side, Second Street and Avenue B. Um, it's, not the, it's not the community that it is now, um, the more gentrified community. It was really at that time the heroin capital of, of the world. And, um, and I too was embarrassed. I went to Hunter College High School, which is a very elite school, and none of, the, none of my classmates would come 
um, and study with me because they were scared to come to my house. So when, when I heard that today, it really brought me back. Um, but, um, but still, there were places like Henry Street Settlement, right, like Grand Street Settlement, like University Settlement, where um, I could be mentored, where I could come alive, where I could be participate in the arts. And so I really want what I had uh, for every young person. Uh, thanks, Nicola. I, it's a hard act to follow again. Uh, it's the last of uh, um, uh, uh, some excellent comments. Um, you know, I think in terms of uh, the situation of children in urban areas, and it's been raised a few times, but um, I don't know if we've, if we've done justice to the key point in the State of the World's Children Report and what I think some of us have been alluding to, but is that the trends currently globally are not positive in terms of the gro growing inequities. Basically, we're on, a, uh, we're on a negative trajectory right now in growing inequities between uh, different parts of urban centers. Um, and that's very worrying for all of us. Um, so again, it comes to what's the solution. We've talked about the importance of mapping, as Mark has mentioned, and, and no, the challenge, of course, of mapping or data is two, in a way. One is, is it adequately disaggregated? Do we know enough about particular parts of a city in terms of spatial, as was mentioned, or characteristics of who are the most disadvantaged? And we've talked about it tends to be girls or the disabled or particular ages or ethnic groups or minorities, etc. And that, as has been mentioned, we have a complete absence of data. Um, so without knowing enough, uh, it is very difficult to engage with senior decision makers and hold people accountable for changing the situation. That's something that UNICEF is engaging more and more in, and all of us in, uh, need to work more on that. But even if you were to highlight the situation, okay, so these are the growing disparities and these are the worrying trends, then it comes to why is it like that? And that comes to Alberto's point of this vertical and horizontal, what he calls horizontal um, issues. But to understand that, it's very difficult, I think, to be seen in numbers. One needs to have enable people to express themselves. And that's Jean's point and Pamela's point of these platforms of engagement and engaging with, to better understand what are the challenges that, that the most disadvantaged kids face in an urban area? What are the hurdles that they constantly have to jump over in order to realize their dreams? And I wouldn't dare try to uh, claim to understand that. That is the only thing that I think we can do is provide those opportunities for people to express themselves. And then for us to leverage our relationships, UNICEF and others, to ensure that, as Alberto said, people listen, um, because you can speak, but if you don't listen, I take the point. And so maybe that's us now as adults and as maybe in positions of uh, authority in the sense of having able to engage with those who have obligations to change to ensure that people listen and respond adequately. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sue, for... Thank you, Sue, for um, launching into such great discussion, launching the panel into such great discussion. So now it is over to you um, in the audience for a question and answer session. So there are two microphones, one over here, one over there. Everyone's welcome to ask a question. Please remember to state your name, affiliation, say to whom you are directing your question, and please keep it brief. So um, we'll start over there on my left. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm not usually so fast at getting up, but I've got a train to catch. So <laughs> thank you very much for letting me have the first uh, opportunity. I'd just like to really, uh, my name's Charles Waters. I'm, the, I'm chair of the Department of Childhood Studies at Rutgers University. And Rutgers, in its wisdom, decided to locate the first childhood studies department in the US in Camden, which is a city of immense diversity and also immense urban poverty. But one thing I want to say about uh, why I think this has been such a successful evening 
is, is two reasons. One is that it's the cornerstone has been listening to experience from Khalid Mansour uh, to the, the youth who spoke. And that really came, brought the whole thing alive for all of us. And, and I'd like to thank you for that. And I'd also like to uh, point out that one thing that is very enriching is the fact that we've focused on the local level, the national level, and the international level as interrelated. In many conferences, there's a process of kind of othering. These things go on in other places. And I think central to the idea of the fourth world is the ubiquity of this phenomenon. And it's very heartening. And I'd just like to say I'm delighted that as a Department of Childhood Studies, we're working with Equity for Children and developing a program of seminars, joint conferences, and so on. And I'm looking forward to some exciting collaborations ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. And would you like to ask a question? No? <laughs> I'd just like to say, it, I. I'd just like to encourage, really, a constant reference point being uh, listening to experience. And uh, if any of the panel would like to elaborate on the importance of that aspect in future projects, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone, would any of the panelists like to elaborate on that? No, it's pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> OK. Um, um, I got two questions, just two, two mini questions. Can you tell us your name first? My name is Tina Lindsay. I'm Shakura mother, and I'm Samantha Arndt. Um, I want to ask the commissioner, I don't well, know your name, up. but I was listening. But Jeannie. Jeannie, I want to <laughs> ask her, you've been saying that um, it's the community I live in the projects, okay? I live in the projects. And I pop, in the Bronx, and I know it's population, but it's bad over there. We have a community center. What do us parents do to have our kids enjoy that community center? Because I keep on hearing you saying that they got opportunities to go there. I have seven kids, and they, none of them can't go to that community center unless Number one, we have to pay. Number two, we have to do some, they have to do a whole lot of things to go there. So I wanna know what can we do as parents, as parents, I'm a parent of seven kids, you know? As parents, what can we do to strengthen our kids to let them hear our voice because we have to, for us to, for our kids to be strong, we have to be strong for them too. Because if we weak, they're not gonna be strong to get out of poverty. I've been in poverty for 37 years. So I, I saw it, I was at the court. Like I said, I was born in Brooklyn, not the best town. I was born in New Jersey, East New York, where just like you, it was nothing but Heron City. But I wanna know, you keep on, we the highest rate in the Bronx, and I hear it every day on the news when I'm listening to Michael Bloomberg, and I have a close friend that works with Michael Bloomberg and stuff, and I hear him come down and say it's gonna get better. But it's not looking like it's getting better. It's looking like it's getting worse in the Bronx. And it's not getting better for our community. So what can we parents, or what can we encourage our teenagers to see if they have to fight more to go and to, to get these programs? Or do we have to go up front the floor and just say, we definitely need these programs in our community, because we definitely need programs in our community. We definitely need them in that community center. And I don't see the community centers getting recognized for our children, because that's for our children, as that's what y'all say. It's for our children, but it's not getting used for our children on projects. You understand what I'm saying? So what can we do as parents to strip for our kids, to let them see, like, it is going to get better, but I don't see it getting any better. OK, no easy question. <laughs> I wanted to know which um, which housing project do you? He lives in Castleville. Castleville. Um, one of the because um, I had mentioned that we 
um, are responsible for 25 of the community centers. There are probably about a little over 100 community centers, and that's not one of the centers that, that we are um, in charge of. Um, but I certainly, um, I know that um, Chairman Rea, who oversees NYCHA, um, is committed to improving the community centers, and he has hired a new team to do that and to really look closely at what kinds of activities are happening there. And one of the things that I think you can do is to really let them know what, you know, what are your expectations as a resident, uh, what are your expectations for your family, for your seven children, um, and how you would like to see um, how you would like to see that center uh, be operated. Because I think that you know, we have um, done a transformation with the 25, uh, because it's, it's been the community-based organizations that have been leading that effort uh, and, and have been involved in, in really raising the quality of, a, of, of the programming. But um, that, that's not necessarily been done in all of the centers, but it is a model and a vision for what we would like to see. So I think, you know, I think that that would be you know, the way to, um, and I will certainly do my best, uh, because I do see Chairman Rea, uh, to carry the message to him about what I, you know, what I heard here, because it was these same kinds of conversations that led to um, the change that I was talking about. Um, some, some very difficult conversations um, with parents, with residents, with young people. And, um, and I think that that's, you know, that's been the way that we have been able to accomplish um, those changes. But, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, sadly, we're not, you know, we're not in, um, in that center. But we still also have programs that are um, outside of the, um, of the NYCHA facilities that are run by our local community-based organizations. And so one of the things that we can do is afterwards um, try to make sure that you're connected with some of the um, freestanding um, centers that you may be able to take advantage of. Um, Great. Thank you. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, um, I'm listening to what you were saying. I was listening to what her, she was saying. Um, there, there are programs, but um, um, as one of the panelists um, from up here, from Cario, I, don't, I believe, I don't know which one, um, he understood that it also has to um, start from home. And the government, they, they, they set up these, um, these subs of, um, subsidizations or whatever and subsidize um, projects and all the, and that housing subsidize housing, housing, housing and it also has to start from a foundation it has to be a sturdy foundation so as far as programs from out out outside the community it also has to start in the community because Tina said her her um her center isn't active neither is our our centers are active either, and the five, the other five um, proj project builders aren't active either. So, I don't think the programs are getting inside the community like they should be, and it has to start from there. I should say that one of the issues that New York City has, like all cities, is one of scale. So I think yeah. that you know we have. Um, been privileged to do um, innovate and have some great examples. Teen Action is, is really one that I'm very proud of. But at the end of the day, we have 1.1 million um, children in our school system. And so how do we make sure that we have something available for all young people? And I think that is um, the challenge of, of cities, particularly New York City, which is really one of scale. It's not that we don't have good examples. It's not that we're not um, doing um, some very creative and worthwhile um, quality programming. It's that it doesn't reach everyone, all of our young people. Great. Thank you for that answer. We might move to the next question. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm 
question to the point of the, you know, programs just not getting into the communities. And, um, you know, I've lived in New York a little while. I consider myself a New Yorker and just understanding the money driven selfishness, greed based motivations for a lot of activity. Um, I'm just wondering how, you know, we can look beyond ourselves and realize it's really not that hard to find poor and marginalized kids in the urban world, go to the slums, go to the projects. You don't have to spend millions on research, you know, figure it out. Also, it isn't that hard to realize what advances them, which is education. And the failing education rate in this city is ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And I don't know what thousands of people are doing about it, but if you cannot get your children to graduate, it's a huge problem, and I don't know why we find it so difficult to figure out where is the money going in New York, but you know, I don't know if the first priority is for educating its kids. Secondly, you know, the World Bank is also you know, pulling money from capital, or what is it, human capital development, which is this likewise um, education. So I think we all know education is the way for people one way, at least, for people to move forward out of poverty and being quote unquote poor and marginalized. You know, we're all poor and marginalized. But could you just ask your yeah, question? Yeah, my question yeah. is that we're all poor and marginalized, and I'm just wondering how the panelists feel um, they can make a difference in improving the education beyond the mapping. Okay, so your question is to all the panelists? Yeah. Okay, would anyone like to have a go at answering that? Okay, now with the education department, I mean, that's been going on forever and a day, so you can't really, I mean, I'm just being honest because at one point in my life, I was about to drop out of high school and it ain't have nothing to do with money or any of the above, but at the end of the day, education is fundamental, but you have to understand being an inner city youth or not even being an inner city youth. When you have, when you're coming from circumstances where a lot of things are weighed against you and you take out the capita, because human bank capita is no longer involved in it if you haven't realized, there's $2.5 billion that is almost released to half of this country. But all I'm simply saying is, you don't, there's no slums or anything. I'm just saying education is fundamental, but you have certain people who don't. And it has nothing to do with family, background, anything. There are certain people who just don't feel that they're ready to deal with that. Who, if they want to graduate, they can graduate on their own terms. It has nothing to do with money, you know. And you, and you don't have to go around certain places. You don't. You can go in the five boroughs. You don't even have to go in the five boroughs. You can step outside right now and see an inner city person walking past you. But I bet you probably wouldn't even ask their name or try and get to know them or ask if they're inner city youth, or ask what's going on in their life. Some of these people who are sitting right here were former inner city youth, and now they're trying to benefit the better part of America and over. Just Great. saying. Thank you. Great response. Um, also, going back to um, what, we, what we can do to, um, going back to your programs and the schooling, it has to be, the school and the urban, it has to be schooling that will also benefit us, not also in school, but also outside of school. And so just as y'all set up a program for um, children in, in an international country that can um, have, a, have what they do um, benefit what they were um, re surveying them from, our curriculum has to start from there. It has, to, it has to be on a level where we can understand and where we can go outside the next day in our community and go home and say, what I've learned pertains to what I see every day. Because at, at the same time, it's like, it doesn't make sense. It's not gonna add up. You want us to do a curriculum work, but can we use this outside of school? Also, the teachers have to be in an open-minded, area and not try to, not to be scared to teach, but also, or downgraded. or downgraded, you have to be on a level to say, not only am I going to teach, I am going to try to understand and learn a classroom of my children, because as a teacher, I'm supposed to be a versatile person. I'm supposed to agree on all levels. So as I said, meditation um, has helped me um, 
you know, um, clear my mind or, and be focused in a classroom. So if we could bring that into urban city schools, that would be nice because having a program and saying that a program can help help you one day, it has to be something that you can build on. Because like I said, it also starts from a foundation. If your foundation is not sturdy, it just falls. So. Great. I see a lot of nods from the other panelists. Would you like to expand, maybe discuss some of the mapping questions that were raised? No, I was just going to bring up the meditation idea because I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> and um, it's, it's like a reimagining of all these different settings in the community, so the schools, the parks. You know, what do young people think about the rules of the parks? I have some serious issues with the rules of the parks. I cannot go to any playground in my community because I don't have a child to accompany me. And it's the only, it's the only community space. So, you know, having school councils that are not designed to set up proms, but are designed to listen to young people talk about what kind of curriculum they need, what kind of skills they need, what kind of ideas they have for improving their school environments is the solution. Thank you. Okay. Um, next question over there. If you would mind just um, introducing yourself and saying where you're from. I'm Usha Nair, working in the New School University in the colleague of Alberto. I, first thing I would like to congratulate the panelist. It is great panelist. Uh, you have covered the academics, you have covered the NGOs, and you have covered the government, which is one of the rare things which we get in panelists. My question is this. We are in New York. Can New York be the best practice where, on the basis of equity, children are safe? happy, they can move around, and uh, they can get all the developmental activities which childhood requires. We are thinking, you know, Commissioner mentioned about the scale. Now, if we are thinking of scale, if New York can set up an example, then we can think of Mumbai, we can think of Rio, we can think of other cities in the world too. So I would like to ask this Commissioner particularly, what is the what is your plan for the next five years? Or, or, or what is your reimagination, recreation, or innovation that young adults today I hear, they say, when I will think of the child, I will go away from New York. When young adults think and aspire, when I have a child, I would bring up in New York. Thank you. So, Commissioner, would you like to start <laughs> I, off? With I, I, certainly, I certainly have to start every day um, imagining that we're going to have a city where every young person has that caring adult in their lives, where every young person um, can have youth voice and can, and can say and articulate and participate in what they want to see happen um, and, and influence their own uh, destiny. Um, where young people are exposed to, to the arts, where young people are, are challenged, where we have high expectations. I mean, I have to start every single day with that uh, vision. Um, and then, of course, I have to, you know, then the staff remind me I have to live within my budget, you know, and I have to create programs um, that we can afford. And, but I think that, you know, what we've been able to do at least is to put on the ground programs that, um, that are sustainable, that, that are high quality, that, that our research have told us works. We know we can move the needle on so many, in so many areas, including um, not only the socialization of young people, but the education of young people. So um, I know they work, and I know that um, that that is a contribution, and I look forward to a day that we have uh, universal after school and u universal youth development. Um, great. Anyone? Else? Yeah. Can I say something? Uh, I want to say something because we are in a very affluent city, but I would say that globally we are in a very in a moment of growing. Uh, the growing wealth of the world 
was one of the most important in the last 10 years, well, before the, the big crisis of the financial crisis. However, Robert said something that is exactly what is going on. Inequalities are growing all over the world. Urban inequalities are growing. So there is a pattern of how growth, how is now the global pattern in some way create a tension with the effort that you are doing. So I think that really here in New York, the mayor and what you are doing, because I, I know some of the programs, are really very, very important. But I want to highlight the point that we have in a point of tension between a pattern of globalization, a pattern of growth, and this intention that we have to have a better world, to have <coughs> everyone inside and not some inside, small group inside and many out, outside. So that's... Okay, we, we have probably time for one more quick question because the smell of food is quite enticing. So one more question and then we can continue informally. Um, my name is Laura Fortinsky. I am a student here at the New School in the International Affairs Program. Um, and I'm also a board member of an organization called Better Future International. Um, right now we're working in Tanzania and Haiti um, with, with a family care and community um, based care model for uh, orphaned and vulnerable children. Um, my question, I guess, is directed at Alberto, although others as well, um, in regards to the NGO role in all of this. There are many countries that don't have um, the capacity for these type of state programs that we have here in New York City. Um, so NGOs are largely responsible for children and family services. Um, and oftentimes, because of donor constraints, they focus on direct service delivery, um, results-based programming, and the horizontal inequalities are very, they're, they're not often addressed. Um, so how can we kind of integrate that conversation um, within boards, among donors, and try to sort of create this more holistic vision or approach? Well, I think that the NGOs are very, very important. I think that this is a new phenomenon in many of the developing countries and some of the developed countries too. So we, we saw a growth of NGOs that really are doing a change and making a difference at the community level. The point is how we make a strong state and make policies that in some way support the NGOs. The problem is going on a scale. How you combine a big government, strong government, but at the same time, a strong civil society and a strong NGO. Yeah? It's not the problem of replacing the government, but it's the problem of how you combine one with the other. That I think that is something that you are trying to do. So and, that's and sometimes it's the, um, if you, you have to look at the tax structure, because here in this country, you're able to get credit for making deductions to charitable organizations. That's not necessarily true in many, many countries. And so they don't have the financial support uh, to thrive. Great. Would anyone else like to add? Yeah. I mean, one way to think about this issue is to ask, um, Where's the Henry Street settlement in Mumbai? Or are there, are there strong, grounded, diverse, deep into the community NGOs operating elsewhere? That, and they have been so important uh, in the history of New York City. Um, and of course, if we look across all New York City, we don't find those deep-rooted NGOs in every borough, in every neighborhood, right? So even here at home, we could ask why isn't there in a particular place something like a Henry Street settlement? But I do think that is a model, and of course those NGOs are intimately connected to government. They're not freestanding, they're not replacing government. They are doing things by way of their knowledge of the community and the uh, linkages in, deep into the community that the government really cannot do. So it's a, a vital intermediating kind of uh, agency. Um, but I think it would, it would be interesting uh, to, to analyze why we see these uh, 
uh, settlement houses in some places and not others. And to take that uh, analysis afield, to not only look at New York City, but uh, cities in, in poor countries as well. One of the other things that we have been very, very um, involved in is capacity building and making sure that we are working with smaller nonprofits and helping them develop their board, helping them look at fundraising, helping them look at their infrastructure so that they can carry, be in a position to both grow and to carry out uh, these these functions. And that, that is a commitment that we have. And of course, um, it, it helps um, particularly in underserved communities where, as you noted, um, they may not have a strong um, uh, nonprofit sector. But the other thing that has been important is steering our money. If we don't invest in certain strategic communities, then there's no reason for a nonprofit to have been there. And so part of, you know, part of where we fund has a lot to do with whether there is going to be a strong uh, nonprofit sector. Um, I just want to add that while I recognize the important role that NGOs play around the world, in, in the case of Haiti and in the case of countries like transitioning from human conflict, there are also a lot of NGOs that operate and are not held accountable. So for example, um, within Haiti, there are 500 NGOs out of an estimated 10,000 that have registered with UNICEF, meaning that UNICEF kind of has some tabs on what those 500 out of the 10,000 are doing. So a lot of times these uh, NGOs are supported with international money and they bring with them their conceived, their preconceived notions of what a community needs rather than, again, involving young people in those decisions and involving caregivers and parents in the programs that they have. So we need to also be very critical of the role of NGOs and what they're um, simulating around the world. Great. Well, yes. So that will conclude the formal part of tonight's discussion, but please stay around and um, engage in some informal conversations over food and drink. Um, we would like, to, on behalf of the organising team, I would like to thank you for your attendance. You've been a great and patient audience. I hope you have um, had a chance to take the State of the World's Children's Report. Um, if not, they are at, on the table at the back or I'll put up an, uh, a website where you can download it. Um, so please, one more time, join me in thanking our fantastic panelists for a great night of discussion. <laughs>